Hi everyone and welcome to the third video about investigation designs in psychology. So far we have covered uh, experimental design, quantitative observational design and today we're going to be talking about qualitative design. So just a refresher, these are the key ideas and areas of learning we're covering. Really important you understand each investigation design, understand some of the features, advantages, disadvantages and how they're all a little bit, a little bit different. So let's have another look at these, just a refresh. These are the three you are looking at um, and this is the third one we're covering today. So the qualitative design um, is different to all the other designs we've talked about so far because it only collects qualitative data. All right? And we know that this is um, information about the quality of information. So we're not looking at numbers, we're looking at words um, and non-numerical data. Okay, so it could be words, descriptions, meanings, pictures, explanations, etc. Okay. Now, the essential features of the qualitative design. Its overall aim is to really generate that rich data and it's giving people the chance or giving participants the chance to, to really speak freely and to fully explain what they mean and give them the chance to explore ideas more fully. Okay, so this enables richer understandings of behaviour as they occur in real life and you're getting responses from those people as well. Now the focus of a qualitative investigation is finding an answer to a general question. Okay, so an example of this could be, what are the effects of this? Okay, um, of some kind of, um, I guess some kind of variable, rather than predicting in a hypothesis that X leads to an increase in Y. Okay, so we could be talking about um, the consumption of alcohol. It could be, what are the effects of um, consuming alcohol in the home? All right, and letting people kind of talk freely about that, rather than saying that um, consuming alcohol leads to a decrease in reaction time. Okay, you don't have that second variable to be really investigating. Um, now, some qualitative designs can generate both quantitative and qualitative data, but that is quite rare. So just think about qualitative investigations, you're really dealing with qualitative data. Okay, now, this subset, I guess, you've got your investigation designs that branch off into the three different um, designs and the qualitative design actually branches off once again. So you can have two designs here, either focus groups or the Delphi technique. So let's have a bit more of a look at these now. So, focus groups. I'm sure you've probably heard this term. A lot of people talk about it in terms of um, research in marketing. But basically, this is a group interview of about 6 to 12 participants. So it's really, really small. The discussion is led by a trained facilitator. Um, the data, which is going to be a text or image, because we know we're getting qualitative data, is obtained through participant discussion. Okay, And the uh, researchers are just recording everything people are saying. Participants are encouraged to speak really freely. They can ask questions, they can um, discuss things with one another, they can go off on tangents, they can exchange personal stories, they can bounce ideas off of each other. Right? Um, and the way that this is kind of facilitated is by um, the facilitator asking open-ended questions. So rather than kind of asking closed questions that only elicit maybe a yes or a no, you're asking questions like, okay, well, what do you think of... Um, parents providing their underage child with alcohol, getting people to answer. Right? It's a really open-ended question that people can respond to. So here we have a bit of a comic and it says, geez, you're the worst focus group I've ever seen. And it's playing on the idea that they're, they're out of focus. So it's really important to recognise that just because you have open-ended questions, that facilitator is there to make sure that the um, participants stay on track. Okay, so some advantages of a focus group is that they may be more convenient than one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, trying to conduct a lot of interviews is really time consuming um, and also involves a lot of money. You generate really rich data through focus groups and if you're trying to compare this to your other designs, this is going to be an advantage that you focus on. You get really rich in-depth data. Um, focus groups are inexpensive um, and quite easy to conduct. They are useful for collecting information from people who maybe aren't able to read or write. Um, so, you know, for example, especially children. They are useful for exploring sensitive subjects in some cultures. And that's because some people might not feel comfortable in a one-on-one -on -one setting 
talking about um, their feelings on a certain controversial topic. And it might be more convenient to do that in a group, group situation so they feel a bit more comfortable. Uh, it, can always in, it can also encourage introverted people because again, it's not that one-on-one -on -one pressured situation. Now, some disadvantages. So just like it can be an advantage in that group situation, it can also be a disadvantage because people might not feel comfortable expressing opinions. So if you are conducting a focus group about racism, for example, some people might not want to really tell you how they actually feel because they think that others are going to judge them. Okay, so they might give more socially desirable responses. Um, in a group, you guys know in a class setting that some people can sometimes dominate the discussion. Um, interviewer bias can contaminate the results a little bit in this situation, um, either in terms of the way that they're conducting the session, um, also the way that they're interpreting the, the responses as well. Um, and the presence of that observer may influence the behaviour. So just simply, you guys would know the second a teacher leaves the room, you guys would sometimes act very differently. Um, now because of the really small sample size and just the nature of a focus group, it's you really can't generalise those results to the wider population because you can't replicate the exact setting that you've created in that one group. Okay, um, And because of that as well, it's really hard to establish causation. So trying to determine that, you know, this variable has an impact on that variable can be quite tricky because you haven't been able to replicate that exact setting. Okay, so that was the focus group. That was that one subset of qualitative designs. The other one is the Delphi technique. <clears throat> so this also gathers data from a small number of people. Um, but the group doesn't need to be together in the one place. So you might already be thinking about an advantage of this method already. Um, the responses are made in written format rather than in that verbal discussion. Participants are considered experts in a field. Now this is a really important difference as well between focus groups and Delphi technique that you are trying to get data from experts, people who have a lot of knowledge about a certain topic. Um, and the aim of this method is to generate some kind of general agreement among these experts about a particular issue or problem. Okay? Um, now, because you are trying to reach this consensus, this technique involves quite a lot of to and froing. So um, you, you administer a few self-administered self questionnaires, so you send them out um, through a series of steps. The participants never actually meet face to face and they don't actually know who else is involved so it's quite anonymous as well. So let's have a bit more of a look at this one here. So trying to reach a unanimous decision can be extremely difficult and you see this in court hearings when it's um, the jury that's trying to make that decision. Um, yes Your Honour, finally, we finally have a unanimous verdict and you can see they're all quite beaten up there. So this can be quite a long and drawn out process. So process goes like this. So the first step is that the relevant experts, they are invited to provide open-ended opinions on a specific topic. Okay? Um, this usually results in qualitative data. So you're getting back just their opinions, what they think about something. Now the step two, these opinions that we got from step one, they're grouped together by our experts. So this could be our research team. Um, and they identify some themes. Right? These themes are then redistributed to our expert participants for feedback as a self-administered questionnaire. Okay, So they're usually requ required to, um, I guess, um, rank their agreement with the themes that are given um, and this generally results in quantitative data because you're rating your agreement on some kind of numerical scale. Um, now this process is then repeated until some kind of consensus is reached. So depending on how much they disagree would change how long this process takes. Now some advantages here. These are very easy to organise and inexpensive to conduct. So you're not having to get everyone in the same place at the same time. They don't need to take a whole day off work. Um, all those kinds of things that just make these a little bit easier. Um, it's convenient, you are getting data from experts all over the world um, and you're not having to fly them anywhere. You have the benefits of informed people. So you've got people who are experts in their field and um, can actually give you really rich data that way. The Delphi technique also maintains confidentiality because they don't know who each other are. So it means that there's no peer pressure um, to I guess agree with what someone says because you think they might be more of an expert than you are. 
right? Um, it minimizes the disadvantages associated with group decision making as well. So um, having those disagreements in person, um, it can get quite heated as well. Now, some disadvantages. This method, so the Delphi technique, can force a consensus. Um, and this means that where some people disagree, you're going to have to compromise a little bit on your opinions to, to reach a consensus. And this means that opinions can get kind of weakened or washed out in the results. Okay? Researcher bias can contaminate the results, both in that, I guess, generating the themes, interpreting what they're saying, um, that kind of thing throughout the whole study. The results can't be generalized to the wider population. The sample is really small and it's also not representative of all people because you have um, experts in a field. Um, the Delphi technique also doesn't allow participants to openly discuss issues. They can't bounce off each other, um, they can't respond to each other. It is purely between themselves and that piece of paper that they are filling out. Okay, so when you're looking at experiments or just research, when should you be using qualitative or quantitative um, designs and data? So qualitative, this is good for research about meanings and experiences and trying to uncover the real depth of a topic. And um, it also provides more meaningful data. Now quantitative designs um, and data in comparison, these are really good for a restricted focus about people's behaviour. Trying to compare two variables, um, get some really clear data, um, try and establish that cause and effect, but also um, noting there that it's people's behaviour, this is really good for as well. So um, to give you an idea here, here is a little comic. So on the left we have quantitative methods. Um, you've got a free ice cream van, a little person getting one, and you can see a little researcher over here is noting that only one in 30 will take the free ice cream. The qualitative method um, on the other side, however, you've got the same person taking the ice cream and you've got the researcher coming up to the person and saying, what did you feel when you saw the free ice cream? Um, and he said, excited, a little scared, and why was that? So you can already see the difference in the data generated and what kind of responses you're going to get. So just to recap, we have now finished talking about all three investigation designs. You should have a really clear understanding of what each of them are, their key features, advantages, disadvantages, and I guess how they're different and how they're used for very different types of research. This has been quite a long video, so if you need to review, please do so. Please ask me questions and have a look at these resources if you need. See you next time.